Uh, all right, so now I'll talk for a while and then we'll stop for questions. And you can ask questions about anything. That is, any question that's on this sample question sheet that interests you or anything you'd like to have clarified. But let me say a little bit both about the course and about the exam. Effectively, the course divides into uh, three parts. In the first part, I present you with a theory of social ontology. In the second part, I present you with a theory of rationality, including a discussion of free will as part of the problem of rationality. And then in the third part, I discuss uh, applications uh, to specific issues, uh, such as uh, the traditional issues in the philosophy of social sciences, um, uh, most specifically those having to do with the nature of the explanation of social phenomena, but also there were a whole lot of other issues that came up. Uh, such as uh, background causation, um, uh, uh, the nature of political power, and human rights. Now what I did last time I taught this course was organize uh, the exam around those three topics. I, I, we haven't made an exam yet, but that's one possibility. And the way it worked last year is there were three parts to the exam. One part on social ontology, one on rationality, and one on applications of the theory. And each part gave you a choice, and you had to answer two questions from each part. In other words, there's a whole bunch of questions in each part. You pick the two that you most like, and that gives you, in a three-hour exam, you have half an hour each for a total of six answers. So it's fairly straightforward, and there are no trick questions. The idea is to get you uh, to show your, yeah, to enable you to show your abilities, to show your stuff. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to do today, oh yeah, no, we only have, we have two sessions, this one and the next one. At the beginning, next time, I'll hand out those course evaluation sheets so you can uh, give me an uh, evaluation of your impression of the course. And that, I, I, I don't, I, I've been teaching for 52 years, so I don't really, uh, I, I have a pretty a fair conception of my strengths and weaknesses. Uh, but the university administration feels very much more secure if they have these documents. So please spend a few minutes uh, preparing this. I, they, they like to have a form with a lot of marks on it because it makes it look as if, well, I don't know what they think. But they, they insist on it, so what the hell. Let's do it for them. Uh, all right. <clears throat> now, uh, the basic way in which this course differs uh, from uh, standard courses in the philosophy of social science. Originally, when I taught this many years ago, it began as a course in the philosophy of social science, but I realized it wasn't a, a, a conventional course in the philosophy of social science, so I insisted uh, on a change in the name. Uh, the name is not the philosophy of social science, but the philosophy of society, analogous to the philosophy of language and the philosophy of mind. And as I told you, I think, in the first lecture, uh, subjects in philosophy are not eternal. Uh, there's no way that Immanuel Kant could have taught a course called the philosophy of language. It didn't exist. It was invented uh, by Gottlob Frege. And even the philosophy of mind is a recent uh, invention. And what I'm suggesting is that we should invent a course called the philosophy of society. And that will stand to the social sciences in a way that the philosophy of mind stands to psychology and cognitive science, or the way the philosophy of uh, language stands to linguistics and logic. It is the philosophical aspects of a certain area. OK, now the actual conception of human social ontology I gave you is fairly complicated, but it admits of a, a fairly concise summary. You start, you start off with individuals who have collective intentionality. Now given collective intentionality, uh, they are able to make assignments of function of a collective kind. Uh, and already we've introduced an important ontological distinction between uh, those features of the world that are observer independent and those that are observer relative. And functions are always observer relative because something has a function only relative to some attitude which assigns a function to it. Uh, so uh, this piece of uh, calcium has a function. I can write, use it to write on the blackboard, but it uh, 
has that function only because we treat it that way. That is, uh, it was manufactured, produced, and sold with that function in mind. Uh, so functions are always observer relative. And strictly speaking, you don't have to have society in order to have the assignment of functions. I can uh, use uh, I, uh, a, a piece of carbon that I find uh, to write with. But uh, the observer relativity still exists. And there is a special class, however, of functions which is of stunning importance. And as far as I know, it only exists among human beings. And that is the class of status functions. Now, the key notion in this course is the notion of a status function. And it's worth my explaining that notion to you again. Human beings, as I said, are capable of assigning functions. Uh, but so are beavers. They build beaver dams. Uh, so are birds. They build birds' nests. Uh, so are uh, primates. They're able to use stick uh, to dig out ants, which they then eat. Um, but humans have this remarkable ability. Humans can collectively assign a status to an object or a person. And then, in virtue of the collective assignment of that status, the person or the object is able to perform a function which it could not perform in the absence of the collective assignment of that status. Now, once you think about that, then it turns out uh, examples are everywhere. Uh, for you to have money in your wallet, the bits of paper are money only in virtue of having been assigned a status. And in virtue of that status, they have a function that they can only perform because of that collective assignment. Notice that this guy has to be collective. The status functions only work if other people accept it. So if I decide to get a bunch of pieces of paper and decide I'm to use them uh, as money for myself, uh, my left hand buys things from my right hand, it's quite meaningless. It only works as a status function if there is a group that accepts it. If you have two or more people through collective intentionality who accept the assignment of status functions. So uh, I've been giving the example of money, uh, but government and private property and universities uh, and summer vacations and cocktail parties and friendships and love affairs and marriage and divorce are all examples of status functions. They're all cases where a status is assigned to an object or a person and then uh, the person or the object can perform that function in virtue of that collective assignment. Now, the mark of the philosopher is the ability to be astounded uh, by, by what any sane person just takes for granted and is, thinks is too obvious to be worth mentioning. And I want you to be philosophers about these status functions. I want you to be astounded. If we all get together and solemnly agree uh, that, let's say, it's now raining, it still isn't raining. But if we all get together and agree uh, that some, in a certain way that something is money or somebody's going to be the chairman of the meeting or somebody's going to be the president of the United States or some two people are going to be married, then it is money, president, chairman, marriage, etc. You can create a reality by <coughs> treating it, regarding it, assigning it a status function. And that is a stunning achievement. Now, what makes that possible? How is it that we can po uh, do that? Well, it has to be done linguistically. Uh, you have to have a linguistic mode of representing a status functions. Why? Well, you, they can only exist insofar as they are represented. But the peculiar forms of representation in question require language. Animals don't do it. Why not? Well, they don't have the linguistic means to enable them to do it. Now, I want to go over this slowly. So let's stop now and take questions about what I said so far. I want you to see the connection between the observer relativity of the phenomena that we're talking about. So status functions 
our observer relative. But of course, that people actually have the collective assent intentionality that assigns them the status function. That's observer independent. Our thinking that it's money is something we do regardless of what anybody else thinks. But it's only money if we think it's money. It's only, he's only a president. It's only a university. We're, it's only a cocktail party if we have these attitudes toward it. Now that has an important, a whole bunch of important consequences. One is it has the consequence that a status functions have an element of ontological subjectivity. That is to say, the attitudes are part of the existence of the status function. And the attitudes are ontologically subjective. Remember, I gave you a distinction between the epistemic sense of the objective subjective distinction and the ontological sense. It's a weird fact about intellectual history that that distinction has been neglected. Uh, as far as I know, I was the first philosopher to point it out. It's kind of obvious. It's not a hard uh, notion. Uh, but there's an enormous struggle in our culture about objectivity and subjectivity. And I don't think you can think straight about those issues if you don't make the distinction between the ontological sense and the epistemic sense. Uh, it's important to do that. Otherwise, you make a, a fallacies of a kind that used to be very common. Here's how it goes. I used to tell neurobiologists, you guys have to get busy and give us a neurobiology of consciousness. A standard answer I got was, on your own account, consciousness is subjective. But science is objective, so there can't be a science of consciousness. Everybody got that? Well, it's a, I, I, I've told you this before, but I'll tell you again. It is a fallacy of ambiguity over the distinction between objectivity and subjectivity. Yes, indeed, consciousness is ontologically subjective, but that doesn't imply that you can't have an epistemically objective science of consciousness. Ontological subjectivity of a domain does not preclude an epistemically objective science of that domain. Now, I think that's kind of obvious, but I'm going to go over it in low gear just to make sure everybody got it. Epistemic objectivity and subjectivity are features of claims. Uh, if I say that uh, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger used to work in Los Angeles, uh, that is epistemically objective. You can, fig you can uh, uh, figure out the truth or false that independently of your attitudes. But if I say Schwarzenegger is a better governor than Gray Davis, well, that's a matter of opinion. Uh, there are uh, dyed-in-the-wool Davis followers who think that uh, Davis was better. So that is epistemically subjective. As they say, it's a matter of subjective uh, uh, opinion. Uh, if, if I say that the, he's a better governor. But whether or not Schwarzenegger used to work in Los Angeles, that's epistemically objective. That can be settled as a matter of fact. So epistemic objectivity and subjectivity are features of claims. Ontological subjectivity and objectivity are modes of existence. Most of the things that interest in the, interest in the science are epistemically, uh, are ontologically objective, like uh, molecules, tectonic plates, galaxies. Those are all ontologically objective. But there's a class of entities that includes pains and tickles and itches and twinges and, and uh, states of depression. And all of those are ontologically subjective in the sense that they only exist as experienced by a human or animal subject. All right, now why is that important? Because we're going to be investing a domain that has an element. It's not entirely subjective, but it has an element of ontological subjectivity but that doesn't mean, it doesn't imply, that you can't have an epistemically objective science of the domain. In one sentence, ontological subjectivity of a domain does not preclude epistemic objectivity of a science of that domain. And incidentally, this was a bad argument even in the early days. If you go to any university textbook store and look at textbooks in neur neurology where they're trying to train these doctors, uh, they have to treat uh, a pain as something about which you can have an objective science. It's epistemically objective. They, and they can't say, well, we're not going to talk about pain because it's not scientific. They have to. They got patients who are actually suffering. Uh, OK, but now we're going to go the next step and figure out 
How is this possible? What features of language make it possible that there can be an epistemically objective, sorry, that there can be an ontologically subjective but epistemically objective domain of status functions that admit of scientific study in such disciplines as economics and political science. All right, questions so far. I'm summarizing very rapidly a complex argument. Everybody's up with us. Yes, at the back, yeah. Yeah. All right, so let me go over that. If this were a course in the philosophy of language, I would bore you to death with this very question. Uh, intentionality with a T is what we've been talking about, and intentionality with a T is a property of m the mind and mental states by which they are directed at or about objects and states of affairs in the world. Intentionality with an S is a feature of sentences and other representations according to which they fail certain tests for extensionality. The standard, the most famous test for extensionality is called Leibniz's Law. And Leibniz's Law says if two things are identical, they must have all of their properties in common. Now Leibniz's Law is standardly taken to imply that whenever you have two expressions that refer to the same entity, then those expressions can be substituted for each other in the same statements without, oh, wrong one. I want to get this guy to go uphill. Without changing the truth value of the statement in which they occurred. So it goes this way. Leibniz's law says that if A equals B, then that implies that A has the property F if and only if B has the property F. And this is usually taken to imply that whenever you have two expressions that refer to the same object, you can substitute one for the another without changing the truth value of the original. Uh, but it's clear that there are a lot of contexts in which you cannot make these substitutions. If you say Sam believes that F A, uh, but it, it, and A equals B, it doesn't follow that Sam believes that F B because he might not know uh, that A equals B. And I gave you an example of that. Uh, you all remember uh, the great American outlaw Jesse James. And at one point, Jesse had an alias. He called himself Mr. Howard. Uh, Jesse James is identical with Mr. Howard. And I know this, I know this is true because it's in the song. The dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard laid Jesse James in his grave. Uh, you're lucky. I won't sing it today. Uh, 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 my operatic voice is, is on, on a holiday. Uh, now, uh, we know that the dirty little coward, Robert Ford was his name, only killed one guy. He killed Jesse. Uh, but Jesse was Mr. Howard. So uh, the Jesse James was identical with Mr. Howard. But we will suppose that when Jesse was hanging out in Northfield, Minnesota, pretending to be an upright citizen, calling himself Mr. Howard, the sheriff believed that, we call him the S, believes that Mr. H is honest. Uh, but if you ask uh, Sheriff, do you believe Mr. Howard is honest? Oh yeah, very honest, upright citizen. How about Jesse James? Do you believe that Jesse James is honest? No, no, he's a notorious outlaw. I'd like to catch him because he's, uh, there's a reward wanted for him, dead or alive. Okay, now, from the sheriff believes that Mr. H is honest, and Mr. H is identical with Jesse James, you cannot infer the sheriff believes that Jesse James is honest. You can't make that inference because you can't make the substitution of co-referring expressions. You can't substitute identicals in the sentence that begins the sheriff believes. For that reason, the sentence is said to be non-extensional with respect to substitutability. 
extensionality is a matter of passing tests for extensionality, and the favorite test is substitutability. The sheriff believes that Mr. Howard is honest, doesn't pass the test of substitutability, so it's said to be intentional with respect to Leibniz's law, with respect to substitutability. Now, what's the connection between intentionality with an S and intentionality with a T? Notice that the sentence the sheriff believes that Mr. Howard is honest is a sentence about an intentional with a T state. The sheriff believes that. So though the belief itself is not intentional, the sentence with an S, the sentence about the belief is intentional with an S because the sentence about the belief fails a test for extensionality. Substitutability is the all-time favorite test. Frege was the guy who discovered this. But another famous test is called existential generalization. And there's another law. This is one law, Leibniz's law. There's another law called existential generalization that says whenever you have f of a, you can infer there is some x such that f of x. In other words, you can existentially generalize I, any a true statement of the form f a, you can say there exists something that has the property f. So if I say John lives in Sausalito, uh, then it follows that there is some x such that John lives in x. But if I say John is looking for the lost city of Atlantis, you can't infer that there is some x such that John is looking for x because there might not be such a place as the lost city of Atlantis. In other words, the sentence, John is looking for A, is said to be intentional with respect to existential generalization because you cannot infer the existence of an entity from the fact that John is looking for something under that description. You can be looking for something that doesn't exist. Many sentences in ordinary language are ambiguous over precisely this distinction. If, so, if I say to you, I'm looking for an apartment uh, in Berkeley, uh, it's near the campus and has two bedrooms and rents for less than $1,000 a month, uh, then one answer might be, uh, there aren't any. That's a case where the existential generalization fails. But another one might be, what's the address? And then you might say, well, it's a, uh, uh, it's a 27, uh, 13 Durant. I don't know if there is such a place, but imagine there is. Now, I am looking for an apartment has a reading which is extensional. There is a specific apartment I'm looking for. Sally lives there, and I want to go visit her. And there's another sense of looking for an apartment which is intentional with respect to existential generalization. OK, so let me just summarize uh, what I've said so far. There are typically two tests for intentionality. Existential generalization that says F A implies there is an X such that F X. You existentially generalize uh, the uh, occurrence of A in F A. And substitutability, otherwise known as Leibniz's law, that says if A is identical with B, then any feature that A has, B must have as well. Uh, okay, now notice also in the second example of intentionality, I gave you a sentence about an intentional with a T state. I gave you the sentence, John is looking for, if John is looking for uh, the lost city of Atlantis, then looking for identifies a form of intentionality. In both cases, in both the sentence, John is looking for, and the sheriff believes that, this will have John is looking for A in both this sentence and the sheriff believes that you have the report of an intentional with a T state. Now here's our question. Why is it that intentional with a T states when described are such that the description of the intentional with a T state is characteristically a description, a statement that is intentional with an S. Why are statements about intentional with a T states intentional with an S? And here's the answer to that question. 
The intentional with a T state you've seen is a representation of its conditions of satisfaction. That's the key to understanding intentionality. But the sentence about the intentional with a T state <coughs> is a representation of a representation. So my belief, John's, uh, uh, or let's say the sheriff's belief that Mr. Howard is an honest man, that is a representation of the state of affairs that Mr. Howard is an honest man. Whether or not that state of affairs exists, that's what it represents. Okay, that's a representation. The sentence, the sheriff believes that Mr. Howard is an honest man, is a representation of a representation. For that reason, its truth depends not on how things are in the real world, the real world of Jesse James and Mr. Howard, but rather how things are in the mental world of the sheriff who's busy representing Mr. Howard and Jesse James. So when I say uh, the sheriff believes that, that Mr. Howard is an honest man, I am not talking about Jesse James or Mr. Howard. I'm talking about the sheriff. And I'm saying the sheriff has in his brain a representation. And that's why you can't substitute other expressions that refer to the same thing as that original representation because what you're, you're talking about is not how things are in the real world but how they are in the mental world of the sheriff's representation. Now if you understand that, you'll understand more than most philosophers do about intentional. You'd be surprised how much bad philosophy has been written about this. There, you, there used to be whole books called The Intentions of Intentionality. And there were lots of attempts to prove that intentionality uh, with a T was really the same thing as intentionality with an S. And you can see why the methods of linguistic philosophy lead to a persistent confusion between features of the language and features of the reality described by the language. Uh, that's, a, that's a kind of an endemic error and we just have to avoid it. You can avoid it if you mind your P's and Q's, if you watch it carefully. And the temptation was to think if the sentences about intentional with a T states are intentional with an S sentences, then the states themselves must be intentional with an S. But that's not true, you see. Uh, if, if John uh, believes uh, that Caesar crossed the Rubicon, uh, that sentence, John believes that Caesar crossed the Rubicon, that's intentional with an S because it doesn't admit of substitutability. But the actual belief itself, think now not of the sentence, but think of the belief in John's mind, Caesar crossed the Rubicon, that belief is, in t is as extensional as you can get. That belief is true if and only if anything identical uh, with Caesar crossed anything identical with a Rubicon. And that means... Uh, uh, the belief will be true only if substitutability holds. So the sentence is intentional with an S. The belief itself is not intentional with an S. You can have intentional with an S beliefs. If I believe that the sheriff believes uh, that Mr. Howard is an honest man, then my belief is an intentional with an S belief because it doesn't admit of substitutability. Now, just to add one further wrinkle to this, I didn't mean to give a whole lecture on this, but it's, uh, this is kind of interesting stuff, and it's, uh, I, if you read any philosophy, you'll find this all the time. There's another distinction that is sometimes you can give reports of intentional with a T states that are extensional reports. So instead of saying the sheriff believes that Mr. Howard is an honest man, you can say, look, about Mr. Howard, about that very guy, the sheriff believes he's an honest man. Now that, there's a fancy terminology for that. That is called a de re belief, where de re means of the object itself, as opposed to de dicto, which is about the uh, report. Uh, and the de re belief does the report of the de re belief does admit of substitutability. Because if I can say, look, about Mr. Howard, the sheriff believes he's an honest man. Well then, since Mr. Howard is Jesse James, and about uh, Jesse James, Mr. Howard believes he's an honest man under some other description, under some other name. Uh, now, philosophers have two persistent uh, intellectual uh, mistakes. One is to think uh, anything you put in logical symbolism must be clear and you must know what you're talking about. But another less common mistake but still common is to think anything you can say in Latin 
must be clear, and you must know what you're talking about. Uh, now, I think, in general, people don't know what they're talking about when they talk about these things. They think we've discovered that there are two kinds of beliefs. There's the de re belief, where the object itself is part of the belief, and there's the de dicto belief, where the object itself is not part of the belief. No, that's a muddle. There are two kinds of reports of beliefs. There's the de re report, where the reporter commits himself or herself to how things are in the world. And then there's the de dicto report, where you don't make that commitment. Where if I say, look, now there's this guy, Mr. Howard, about Mr. Howard, Jesse, the sheriff believes he's honest under some description or other, then that's me. I'm committing myself to the existence of Mr. Howard. But if I say, the sheriff believes that Mr. Howard is an honest man, that doesn't commit me. I'm just reporting a belief in that case. Okay, I'm sorry to give such a long-winded answer, but I could literally lecture for hours on this because there's so much confusion out there, but I think you got it. Okay, I, I, other questions now about what we said so far. I mean, all this is important for us because, of course, reports of states that are intentional with a T will character, characteristically be intentional with an S reports. And we have to be careful about that, that we uh, make sure that no, we're not committing any mistakes that depend on uh, failures of extensionality. Yes? Um, can you please, please go back to the um, role of language? Yes, OK, let's discuss that. That's, I want to talk about that. All right, now, uh, we got to the point where we assign status functions. How the hell does that work? And again, we've got to allow ourselves to be astounded by this. Because as I said, if we all agree that it's money, then it's money, if you have a certain kind of way of agreeing and so on. Uh, but if we all agree that it's raining, then it's not raining. Uh, so what's the difference? How is it that you can create a reality by just agreeing? Well, as you know, my uh, thinking has gone through two stages on this. When I wrote the first book, I asked you to look at I said it's very simple. There's a constitutive rule. X counts as Y in context C. Now it's clear uh, that it seemed to me saying X counts as Y in context C requires some means of saying that. It requires some means of representation. Because the X term isn't something you can go and discover. You see, I can discover uh, that this thing holds water, but I can't in that way discover that the piece of paper is money. It's only money if people count it as money. To put this in a, uh, in a very crude way, since the Y term only applies by kind of fantasy, by sort of collective uh, fantasy that we have, that is, we think it's really money, he's really president, there has to, it only works insofar as we represent it, then there must be some means of representing it as why. Language is going to be essential uh, because you have to have some means of representing it as why. Now, I think that was the view that I announced in the first book uh, that I wrote about this, that it's all a matter of X counts as Y. But then I should have asked myself and didn't ask myself till later, what kind of a speech act is that? And how do you deal with cases where you don't have an X term, where you just create a corporation out of nothing? And there I get a different formula. Namely, we make it the case by representation, by declaration, that the Y status function exists. Now it turns out, then, that on either account, language is essential because either you're counting something as something that it's not intrinsically, in which case you've got to have uh, 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 some means of doing that, or it is simply a matter of performing a status function declaration. Now, why do you have to have language for that? Well, to put it very crudely, both, on both accounts, institutional reality exists only insofar as it's represented as existing, and you have to have some way to represent it as existing. Now, for us humans, the only way to do that is language. Maybe there's some uh, a race of supernatural beings that could do it by uh, uh, thinking in pure platonic forms and then communicating by mental telepathy. But if for beasts like us, you've got to be able to talk. Now, what's the proof of that? Well, let me go over this slowly. I'll take a question in a second, but let me uh, get this out first. 
it's very easy to imagine a tribe that has a language but doesn't so far have private property, marriage, government, or money. In fact, something like that is true of the uh, Pitaha, according to Dan Everett. They have a sort of uh, private property because they have uh, I, the shirt on my back, though only rich people have shirts, but, but the shirt on my back uh, is mine. Uh, but they don't have much by way of private property, and they don't have anything by way of money or government. Uh, they sort of have uh, boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, but they're pretty, flux uh, pretty flexible. Okay, so it's easy enough to imagine a tribe that has a language but has no private property, money, and government. But now try the other way. Imagine a tribe that has money, marriage, private property, and government, but no language whatever. They have no language at all. And I want to say you can't imagine that because you have to imagine that these things are represented as government, uh, uh, et cetera, that you're representing these phenomena, and you'd have to have some way to represent them. Now, what's the argument for that? Well, let's slow down and go over that. The reason I'm interested in this is I thought this point was kind of obvious, that the, the status functions can only exist if you have some linguistic way of representing them. Uh, but in Colin McGinn's review uh, of this book in the, in the uh, New York Review of Books, he says, no, no, you just have to think in concepts. If we all got together and think in concepts uh, that it's money or private property, that would be enough. Now, I wonder how do you think in concepts with no language? Maybe you could do it where for simple cases that are very close to the um, perceptual stimulus. Maybe an animal might have the concept of red uh, uh, and operate with that concept without a language. But money, private property, government, and I, I, let, me take, uh, let me just finish this thought and then I'll take questions. She's first and then you're next. Um, if you think, if you, I, I think, try to think any uh, thought involving any complex institutional uh, phenomena. And I, uh, this morning, I was struck uh, by the following uh, thought. Um, uh, the president's apparent deal with the Republican majority in the House of Representatives to get an extension of uh, the unemployment uh, compensation in return for a continuation of the uh, Bush cuts in income tax is likely to create problem for the Democrats. Not a complex thought. It, it, it was on every uh, uh, news broadcast, or at least it was on the ones I heard this morning. Okay, now think that thought in words. Now think the very same thought with no words at all about the president and the income tax and the congressional majority. I can't do it and neither can Colin McGinn or anybody else. Uh, now this is just a fact about, uh, I don't know about what it's like for gods. I've never been one, I don't know any. But for human beings, to, concepts require some form in which the concept exists in your mind. It could be an image. For most human beings, it's words. Now, not all thinking requires concepts or words. When I'm skiing fast or driving fast, I just respond to the environment. Uh, and I am thinking, uh, but I'm not using words or concepts. I'm just, I, uh, later on I could say, well, I realized I had to turn left or I'd hit the tree, uh, or suddenly there were skiers skiing in my way and I had to stop to avoid hitting them. But on the spot, I was not thinking in words. But when you talk about things involving status functions, like money and private property and government, then you have to have some means of representing them. There's no, uh, there is no stimulus that produces the sense of an obligation, a requirement, or a duty. You have to have some means, and you have to, in fact, have a network in order to represent those things. Okay, so there is an argument as to why language is essential for the creation of institutional reality, but from my point of view, it's essential on both this version uh, where that's only, uh, and then on this version, where the original version is only one way of creating status functions. I'm going to stop now for questions. First, you, and then you. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Is that Tell me the form on which the behavior is described. You see, here's the point. Um, uh, uh, there are two uh, uh, standard his great historical mistakes. Uh, one is philosophers used to, and I guess are starting again to believe in something called concepts. And psychologists used to, and maybe they're starting again to believe in something called behavior. Uh, now, both of these are confusions. If you describe the behavior in institutional terms, if you say things like, well, they t defer to Sally when questions of great importance are concerned, then I want to say uh, that ascribes to them an, a whole lot of uh, institutional apparatus. If they just say, well, they make these noises through their mouth and they move their elbows in a certain way, that's a different kind of behavior. So, I mean, let me answer the question directly. It's this. You can assign a status function without performing an explicit speech act. You just have a set of representations that constitute the assignment of status function indirectly. What is the form in which that takes? Well, you say things like, well, uh, we can't really decide this question until we talk to Sally. Or we say things like, well, Sally's the boss. Or well, I don't know what Sally will think when she gets home. Uh, and those are cases where, uh, the, on my term, those are status function declarations because they are creating an authority by representing that authority as existing. Now, that's the crucial point. Uh, in, the, in the big deal cases, the cases that are most interesting to us, you make somebody president uh, only by performing an explicit speech act. But there are all sorts of other cases that involve status functions where it's not explicit. Uh, somebody can be uh, a very good friend uh, or a lover uh, without there being an explicit speech act of the form, you're my very good friend or I'm your lover. I, I, in fact, often if you try to make it explicit, it um, messes things up. Uh, so sometimes ex inexplicitness works better for various sorts of uh, uh, delicate social reasons. But all the same, you are creating an institutional reality by representing it as existing. Okay, so I mean, let me just summarize the, uh, the answer to the question. You can create a status function by representing it as existing without forming an explicit speech act, but you must have some representation. It must have some representation of its existence, otherwise it doesn't have an existence. What's the test for the existence of the status function? Now this is a crucial point, I haven't said it yet, so let me emphasize it. The test for the existence of a status function is, is there a deontology implied? Uh, if it's a genuine case of a status function, Sally really is the boss, uh, uh, that guy really is your boyfriend, uh, uh, you really do owe money, then in all of those cases there is a deontology implied. There are obligations of uh, friendship, uh, obligations of owing money, and all of those are cases of there being a deontology. So whenever you have a status function, you have a deontology. Now the next big deal, I'm going to say it in a minute, and that is it's about rationality and desire independent reasons. But first say some more. I want to make sure you're happy with this or that you understand it. Yeah. That's right. No. Uh, what I'm saying is that the representation of a status function requires a representation of a deontic power. And the deontic power goes beyond the sheer physics of the situation. Perceiving the phys physics of the situation doesn't yet get you a deont deontic power. The deontic power can only exist if it's represented as such. And in some broad sense, that has to be language. Yeah, that's the point. Okay. Now Jennifer had a quick looking into the mind of Tom again. Maybe he's thinking that if concepts are holistic that we could get the type of institutions that we would want by having imagery uh that constitutes concepts with the operators and all the operators. 
I don't think that's his picture. I think his picture is this. Uh, and he gets it out of Rutgers. He taught in Rutgers for a while, and he was with Jerry Fodor. And I think it's, I, it's philosophy always goes backwards. Every uh, jump forward, you get, uh, you get jumped two steps backwards. Wittgenstein struggled mightily to give us, the, the, uh, uh, give us an account of the role of language in thought. He overstates it. He says thinking just is manipulating symbols. It just is operating with symbols. That's too simple. There are forms of thinking. I just gave you some when I'm skiing down a mountain that don't involve symbols. But the picture that Colin has is this. The function of language is just to attach words to the concepts. But you can have the concepts without any language. You can have the concepts just flowing through your mind with no language. And I'm saying that's uh, impossible. Uh, there may be some very simple concepts, like color concepts, that you can have without any language. But the concepts that I just used about Obama and the presidency and the House of Representatives and, uh, and extending the tax cuts and the problems that you're going to have with the Democrats, th those concepts you cannot have without a language. I, it is not the case uh, that my dear Gilbert, wonderful dog though he is, is lying there thinking about Obama's problem with the Republicans and how he's going to cope with a Democratic majority. Uh, and it's not because he's too dumb. Uh, maybe he is too dumb, but it's because he hasn't got the apparatus necessary to think that thought. So the real problem in McGinn is that he thinks concepts and language are totally separable. They're not. Uh, you can make little separations here and there, though that's trickier than you might think. Uh, imagine. Uh, how you would design an experiment that showed that a dog not only was able to discriminate red from green, but had acquired the concept of red as distinct from the concept of green. Now, I could design you such an experiment, but it would involve the ability to respond uh, in ways that are totally independent of an immediate stimulus, where there, it responds to the thought of red or green without an immediate stimulus of red or green. Tricky, but with obligation, you can't do it. See, again, back to Gilbert. Gilbert is a good dog in many ways, but he never reflects on his obligations. He never thinks, now here's what I am under an obligation to do now, and I better allow my obligation to overcome my inclination. On the contrary, nothing overcomes Gilbert's inclinations because he hasn't got the apparatus uh, to deal with that overcoming. Now, I don't know how to say this in 750 words. That's how many words the New York Review is going to give me. So I cheated. What I say in the article is, uh, McGinn is totally mistaken. If you want to know in detail why, go to my website where I spell it out. And you're, what you're getting is the website version, uh, because I don't know what the uh, readers of the New York Review would make of uh, a deontic operators operating uh, using linguistic methods with a distinction between wide and narrow scope. I just don't think I'm going to do that in the, in the case of the New York Review. But I can do it in my I, I think, I, I don't know what a blog is exactly, but I vaguely have the feeling I should have a blog. If somebody knows what a blog is, give me one or teach me how to make one for myself because I'm going to put this on a website. Uh, I don't know if that counts as a blog or not. Uh, okay, yes. Yeah, I didn't say it made them epistemically objective. Yeah. Okay, I wasn't saying that. No, here's what I'm saying is, it is possible to have an epistemically objective science of a domain that is ontologically subjective. Now, let me give you some examples. Uh, there is a science, I granted that there are some doubts lately, there is a science of economics. But of course, the phenomena studied by economics are ontologically subjective. They are money. Uh, interest rates, uh, private property exchange, all of those are ontologically subjective. There is an objective science of economics, even though economics is a domain that contains elements. It's not all uh, economic, uh, ontologically subjective. There are actual, uh, pr there are a actual objects being produced in factories, and that's not ontologically subjective. But the basic terms of the domain, like money, interest rates, private property, and exchange, all of those are ontologically subjective. They only are what they are because we think that's what they are. Now, we can create an objective science of a domain that is ontologically subjective. 
when the history of this era is written, I think one of the things that's going to be pointed out is economists started thinking that they had a discipline like physics, that they didn't have to reflect on the fact that it all depends on people's attitudes, which can fluctuate uh, from one month to the next. And there comes a fine day when all this precious property uh, uh, in Dublin uh, or uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, is no longer valuable. What do you mean? It had, we, we can prove that it had value. We can prove uh, the size of the mortgage that was issued and the amount of money that was paid for it, but it all collapsed. It collapsed in a way uh, that gravitational attraction does not collapse. So uh, one of the scandals of the contemporary intellectual era is we don't know what the hell happened in 2008. I mean, you can read newspaper accounts. Yeah, there was a real estate bubble. Well, we all know it was a bubble. But why did it collapse? Well, I don't, nobody has given me a, an intellectually satisfying account of that. Here's another wonderful contradiction, and nobody points this out. The United States, following absolutely standard Keynesian methods, is attempting to resuscitate the economy by injecting what's called a stimulus. Meantime, we're told over and over, we've got to reduce the deficit. The deficit is going to kill us. Now, you can't have it both ways. You cannot say the intelligent thing to do now is to increase the deficit by, a, a, a by putting stimulus money into the economy, and whatever else you do, you've got to reduce the, the deficit. Now, this seems to me not just the usual I, I, so, uh, contradictory forces operating in public policy, but there's a kind of intellectual lack in that the people who are talking, quite sincere, intelligent people, about the need to reduce the deficit never talk about, and how does this answer uh, the standard Keynesian arguments about how to cope with a recession? I, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm paying these guys up here somewhere. I don't know if they're in this. No, these are anthropologists. But over there uh, in Evans, there's a whole nest of economists uh, why aren't they answering this question? Some of them got prizes and so on. But in any case, that is an intellectual scandal. We don't have an answer to that question. Okay, other questions about this? This is all fun. Yes. Uh, are institutional facts ontologically objective? No, they're ontologically subjective because it's only what it is because we think that's what it is. Now, at the risk, uh, risk of being tedious, I'm going to go through this in some uh, detail. I hold, I hope I got some, I hold these bits of paper. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the things Americans like about their money, it never changes. And to my horror, it's now got a purple, it's got a pur, what, this is for San Francisco or something? I mean, uh, this cannot be right uh, to have purple money. Uh, but in any case, I, what Americans like about their money is I have a, I, I have a piece of national currency that's like 100 years old, and it still looks like American money. It just says national currency on it. I hope it has some collector's value. But in any case, the money doesn't change. Okay. Now, this is a piece of paper. Paper consists of cellulose fibers, and uh, with amateur chemistry, I'll tell you, cellulose fibers are largely carbon. They, and if they're not, well, too bad. I flunked the chemistry exam. Okay, all of that is observer independent. All of that is ontologically objective chemical physical reality. There is, however, another fact about this piece of paper. It's a $5 bill. What fact makes it a $5 bill? Well, there's a complex story about the Bureau of Engraving and Printing and the United States government and the, under the authority of the Treasury. But the bottom line is that there have to be a certain set of attitudes. And those aren't just attitudes about something that, by the way, happens to be a $5 bill, but those attitudes make it a $5 bill and constitute its continuing existence as a $5 bill. And if you think the attitudes don't matter, I'll bring some Confederate money that I have, uh, and those attitudes no longer work. I'll take a question in a second. Just let me finish this thought. Okay, so here's the point. That it is a piece of paper that satisfies certain conditions is ontologically objective. It's just a fact about chemistry that it's got these marks on it. But that it's a $5 bill is ontologically subjective because people's attitudes are essential for it to have those, uh, to, uh, to have that status, to have that status function. But the ontologically subjective fact that it is a $5 bill admits of discussion 
which is epistemically objective. I guess somebody's got an important. His stockbroker was just calling uh, to say that he had to uh, sell in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so everybody, I hope everybody's got this point. Uh, if you got that, you're way ahead of a lot of my commentators. Now, you had your hand up, and then you had yours. You're first, and then you're next. Yeah. Right. Right. Guess what? No. Remember, I told you there are two kinds of objectivity and subjectivity. There is the epistemic kind and the ontological kind. And epistemic, uh, an ontological subjectivity does not preclude epistemic objectivity. So it's epistemically objective that it's a $5 bill, but ontologically subjective. Yeah. It's just a puzzle about how it's worded because it says yeah. objective Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, that's a good point. I, I maybe that's too tricky a question, but the, but what the question was driving at was that the person who answers that question should be able to make the distinction between the epistemic and the ontological sense of objectivity and subjectivity. Somebody with more scholarly talent than I have ought to go through the history of objectivity uh, in uh, the uh, in American in American Western intellectual life. When Descartes uses objectivity, he means something totally different. When he says there must be as much objective reality in the cause of anything as there is in the effect, that's a part essential premise in one of his proofs. Uh, I don't think he means objective in our sense. Uh, but in any case, it would be interesting to know. I, I think that objective-subjective distinction rolled over in bed sometime after the 17th century. It would be interesting to track it down. Okay, somebody else had a question. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. Number 40, let's look at it. Yeah, number 40. Explain the following concepts and distinctions. Give examples of each. Okay, you got a problem with collective and individual intentionality? Collective intentionality is we intend. Individual is I intend. And so on with other cases. We believe. And I think there are even perceptual cases. When you and I are both in the museum and I say, I want you to see how Vermeer's brushwork captures the peculiar delicacy of the woman's fabric, uh, that's a case where we're sharing a visual perception. Okay, that's uh, individual and collective intentionality. Brute facts and institutional facts. Some facts require human institutions in order to exist. Uh, this is money is an institutional fact. Other facts do not require institutions to exist. Uh, the sun is 93 million miles from the earth. That distance exists regardless of what anybody says. No institution is essential for that distance. Notice that in order to state the fact, you require the institution of measuring in miles. But don't confuse the existence of the fact with the existence of the statement of the fact. The fact, the actual distance between the Earth and the Sun is a brute fact. The fact that somebody stated that fact using the system of measurement in miles is an institutional fact. Okay, regulative rules and constitutive rules. Constitutive rules constitute the very activity that they regulate. So the rules of chess or the rules of baseball are constitutive. But regulative rules regulate activities that can exist independently of the rule. So the rule drive on the right-hand side of the road is a regulative rule. It regulates an activity that exists independently of the rule. But the rules of baseball or chess, they regulate, all rules regulate, but they don't just regulate. They constitute in the sense that playing baseball or chess consists in acting in accordance 
with the rules, or at least a big enough subset of the rules. I mean, uh, there are some rules of chess that I never figured out. Taking the pawn en passant, I don't know how the hell you do that. But in any case, I figured out strong side castle and weak side castle. But uh, there are uh, some rules that are probably beyond me. And I think most Americans, though you're brought up playing baseball, probably could not state all of the rules for striking out. You know, the foul bunt when you got two strikes, or when the guy drops the third strike, or when the catcher drops, and so on. But in any case, acting in accordance with a sufficient subset of the rules is constitutive of playing uh, the game. Constitutive rules constitute, regulative rules regulate. Okay, status functions and agentive functions. Well, an agentive function is anything that involves an agent, uh, the specification of an agent. Status functions are a special type of function involving deontic powers. And the test for whether or not a status function is genuinely a status function is, does it carry a deontology? Now, sometimes the same word will shift from citing something that was not a status function to something that is a status function. So in my culture, being a drunk or a nerd or an intellectual is not a status function. There are no special rights, duties, and obligations that go with being a nerd. I, I might feel, as a professional intellectual, I have certain obligations, but those are not collectively recognized. Those are not status functions by collective recognition. Now, maybe we're evolving that. I, France already has it. I mean, France for a long time has had the special role of the intellectual as a kind of a status of the intellectual, and you're supposed to have certain sorts of obligations and duties as an intellectual. And maybe we're evolving something like that in the United States. And you can easily imagine assigning status functions if all drunks are required to register, and then there are certain rights and duties of drunks. Oh, I'm a drunk, so you have to give me another drink or something like that. Then it becomes a status function. But as presently constituted, drunk, nerd, and intellectual do not identify status functions. I taught this course once, and I had a wonderful student said, well, when he was in high school, being a nerd was a status function because he was the class nerd. And he was under an obligation to help everybody with their homework, because that's the job of the class nerd. OK, well, good luck. I've never had that problem. But in any case, that would be a case. If everybody recognized it, if they're yeah, the class nerd, he's got a job to do, then that would be a status function. OK, the causal by means of and the constitutive, yeah. Yeah, of course, yeah. They're not meant to, they're not meant to be mutually exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that's right. Not all these are mutually exclusive. Uh, and indeed, uh, several of the others are not mutually exclusive. Constitutive rules also regulate. It is a constitutive rule of baseball uh, that with uh, a more three strikes, you're out. Incidentally, baseball is built around the magic number three. There are three times uh, three innings, uh, three strikes, uh, three bases. And in the first early days of baseball, three balls got you a walk. But the pitchers couldn't bear that. So they gave up on the magic number, and now the pitchers get four balls. So practical limitations of the ability to hit the strike zone prevailed. Otherwise, the magic number three uh, prevails pretty much throughout baseball. Yes? What? Well, they're there. those that involve an agent. Then an agent actually has to do something, If uh, has to be able to do something if it's an agentive function. So the pre President of the United States has the power to veto legislation. That's an agentive function. Yeah, Jennifer. Yeah. Oh, I see. OK. Well, all right, because in the. In the yeah. 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 What I've done now in the new. Are a 
Right. Okay, so it would be a special subcategory. What I did in the new book was allow for there to be functions that involve an agent, where the agent actually does something, but does something in virtue of a status. So you could have a status functions which were agentic functions. But I agree that's probably a change. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Yeah. You had your hand up. Yeah. Uh, uh, a hammer. Those are agentive functions because they require an agent. Those are agentive functions that are not status functions. Okay. Uh, the causal by means of and the constitutive by way of. Well, the causal by means of is where you drive the hammer, you drive the nail by hitting it with a hammer. By means of hitting it with a hammer, you cause the nail to go on the board. That is a causal by means of relation. The constitutive by way of relation is you vote for the motion by raising your hand, and that is constitutive of voting for the motion. Raising your hand doesn't cause you to vote for the motion. It just is voting for the motion. It's constitutive and not causal. Uh, all right, the accordion effect and basic actions. Well, the accordion effect is where you can expand or contract descriptions of an action. You can say, um, he made noises through his mouth, uh, he uh, uttered an English sentence, he performed the act of making a promise, and he undertook a contract. All of those can be different descriptions of the same action, and they all are cases of expanding the description according to the accordion. Now, the basic action is anything that you can do where you do it without doing something else by way of which or by means of which you do it. So if you ask me, well, how did you make a promise? I might say, well, I said in French, je promets. So there, making the promise would not be basic, but saying je promets would be basic because I don't do that by doing anything else by way of which or by means of which I do it. Uh, philosophers like murderous examples. So pulling the trigger and firing the gun and assassinating the victim would be their favorite example. Pulling the trigger would be basic because I don't do something else by means of which or by way of which I do that. I just pull the trigger. Uh, but assassinating the victim is something is not a basic action, and it's further down on the accordion effect. So the accordion effect is the effect where you can expand and contract a description of an action uh, uh, the way that an accordion expands or contracts. But the the top level of any such a description of any such accordion, something you can do by way of, uh, without doing anything else by way of which or by means of which you do it, that's a basic action. Now this is important because something can be basic for one person and not basic for another. Uh, basic action is relative to background abilities. A really good pianist can play a whole uh, uh, arpeggio, Just she's just good at it. She just hauls off and hits the keys. I can't do that. For me, I, it's hard enough to find middle C. Middle C is a white job next to those three black jobs near the middle. I can find it, but that's uh, uh, the basic action for me is not playing uh, the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata. Uh, okay, there are a whole lot of hands up. Let, uh, one more, observer relative and observer independent. Well, I hope you understand that by now. Observer relative means it only exists relative to some in attitude. I'm reluctant to use this term because some anthropologists think it means a relative to some outside anthropological observer, and I don't mean that. Phenomena within a system, like the fact that something is money, uh, those are observer relative, even though it's not an outside observer, it's an actual participant. Okay, first you, then you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Intentional causation is where a mental state, which is an intentional state, functions causally to produce its conditions of satisfaction, or where the condition of satisfaction function causally to produce the mental state. Now that's when it succeeds. A mental state uh, may fail. So if I'm trying to hammer the nail in, then that's intentional causation because my intention is to drive the nail in the board, 
and that's an intentional state, and that intentional state is supposed to cause the movement of the nail into the board. So intentional causation does not imply success, but the specification of the intentional cause in a case like that specifies the condition of satisfaction. What am I trying to do? Now, why is this important? Well, I maintain that uh, typically all explanations of social phenomena in one way or another rely on intentional causation. You want to know, why did the Germans invade Russia? Why did the uh, Republicans win the last congressional election? Those are cases of intentional causation. Uh, uh, however, um, there are lots of explanations also that don't that discuss intentional causation but deal with systematic fallouts. Uh, so for example, we are now in a recession. Recession doesn't in that way name uh, something which is an, uh, in that way an intentional phenomenon because it can be a recession if nobody knows it's a recession, even if they don't think it's a recession. So that it is a recession is a systematic consequence of a whole lot of intentional phenomena. If I, 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 I standardly de define if you have a fall in gross domestic product for two or more quarters, uh, you're having a recession. But that's something you can discover. That's not a case of intentional causation. So intentional causations produce recessions, but recessions nonetheless can exist in an observer independent fashion. You can discover that you're in a recession. Do you, do you follow that now? So the kind of intentional causation uh, that we're interested here is the case where the uh, conditions of satisfaction uh, go from mind uh, uh, to uh, where the causal relation goes from mind to world. You're trying to change the world by representing how you want it to be changed. You're trying to hammer the nail into the board, or you're trying to become elected president of the United States, or you're trying to win the football game. Those are all cases where you have the mind-to-world uh, direction of uh, a causation. The mind is supposed to change the world, and you have the world-to-mind direction of fit. The world is supposed to be changed in such a way as to match the intentional state. Uh, okay, I hope that answers that question. You got that. Others at this point? Yes, at the back. Yeah. The basic one? Yeah, here's the point. Um, you, want to, you want to explain the structure of human action. Now, typically, the structure of human action, of complex actions, will involve both the causal by means of and the constituted by way of re relations. So when Gavrilo Princip assassinated the Archduke, the basic action was pulling the trigger. By means of pulling the trigger, he fired the gun and so on, and to get to the point where you have a constituted by way of relation, by way of assassinating the Archduke, he struck a blow against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay, now for any such sequence, there has to be a first term. There has to be something that the agent does without doing something else by way of which or by means of which he does it. That something is a basic action. Now what that something is will depend on the skill of the agent. I'm imagining that Gavrilo Princip was an amateur shooter, that uh, he had to you know, think, pull the trigger. If he just did it the way I, I might uh, utter an English word without thinking about each sound that I make in uttering the word, then I, if he just uh, committed the assassination, then that wouldn't be the basic action. For me, uttering an English word is a basic action. I don't have to think, well, how am I going to do it? Or raising my arm is a basic action. I don't think how I'm going to do it. So the basic action is any action you can perform without performing some other action by way of which or by means of which you perform the, ba the, the action. You follow that? Yeah. Okay. Now, other questions? You're, you're next. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, there I want you to tell me what uh, Hempel uh, and those guys think about functional explanations. Now, fu Hempel maintains that the functional analysis doesn't meet uh, uh, the criteria for a scientific investigation because you can't subsume it under a scientific law uh, and it doesn't admit of, uh, of various uh, kinds of counter evidence. 
So you do get, uh, I mean, Hempel has objections to functional explanations. There was a period in sociology uh, when the functional explanations were supposed to, uh, they were regarded as a kind of uh, intellectual breakthrough, uh, that now that we see how much of, of uh, I, uh, sociology can consist in discovering the distinction between the manifest and the latent function and how you can have a functional explanation of the phenomena. This was a, a regarded as an important point, and Hempel is making objections to that. Okay, other uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. If society consists in propositional contents of the form such as this is money, then the propositional contents have a logical structure. Now the reason I put that question is this. I once had an, um, an exchange with a bunch of, an a bunch of anthropologists, and this was printed in the uh, Journal of Anthropology. Uh, there was a whole issue devoted uh, uh, to the theory of social ontology. And when I said society has a logical structure, they thought I meant logical as opposed to illogical. That sort of is a good deal that it has this wonderful logical structure. There aren't any fallacies involved in society. That's not the point at all. The point is simply that society has a propositional content. Something can only be money, president, a university, private property, marriage. All of those things can only exist if they're represented as existing, and the representations have a logical logical structure because they have a propositional content. Now then the question is, well, are, is there any commonality to the logical structure? And I say there is. In fact, there are two operators that are constitutive of institutional reality, and they are uh, the status function declaration and the power creation operator. Now I'm not going to write them all on the blackboard because it takes too much space, but the idea is when you create the status function, you don't just create a function for its own stake, but you do it by giving deontic powers, and the deontic powers provide desire-independent reasons for action. Desire-independent reasons for action. So you really need, if you're going to spell it out, you need uh, two steps, the step where you create the function and the step where the powers are assigned in virtue of the function. Now, to produce, right, take that down to basic uh, case, in the case of uh, Barack Obama being president of the United States, he has deontic powers in virtue of the fact that he's got this status, but he can only function as president if people continue to recognize that he has these deonic powers. So there has to be uh, the, you get this equivalence. Uh, the assignment of function makes possible for there to be status functions. State, all institutional facts are status functions. Institutional facts equals status functions. Status functions imply deonic powers, and deonic powers in turn imply desire independent reasons for action. So you have two distinct stages. The creation of the status function and the recognition and operation of the deontic power. And I don't know why it took me a long time to see that, but it did. That you, got, you, you have to have two separate operators and then you combine them. We collectively accept that such and such a person or object has such and such a status. And with that acceptance, we accept that the, that the uh, person or object has such and such powers. Okay, uh, how much time we got? I mean, uh, uh, we're out of time? Oh gosh, zero. Okay, well now, next time, bring more questions. This was very helpful. Bring more questions and we'll, we'll uh, go over this.